Thank you very much. Thanks for coming out. Um, it's interesting that Naomi Klein is not here to see my talk today. Uh, I'd like to start by showing you my t-shirt. It's uh, made in China. 80% uh, cotton, 20% irony. I want to tell you a little bit about uh, economics today, starting with uh, some 10 principles of economics by Greg Mankiw. So Greg Mankiw is a Harvard professor wrote one of the best-selling economics textbooks in the country, and it's based on these 10 principles. I know there's a lot on the screen, but I generally tell people not to bother reading this. Just take my word that you pretty much need a PhD in economics to understand these 10 principles. Fortunately, I have a PhD in economics, so I've taken it upon myself to translate these principles for the more fortunate among you. We're going to begin by separating them into the first seven principles, which are microeconomics, and the last three, which are macroeconomics. The difference, as P.G. O'Rourke said, it being that microeconomists are wrong about little things, and macroeconomists are wrong about things in general. Uh, we're going to begin with the macro principles, 8, 9, and 10. Now, believe it or not, these all have the exact same translation, namely, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> as proof, I need only remind you that macroeconomists have successfully predicted nine out of the last five recessions. <laughs> And as further proof, we can now go up one font size. <laughs> so let's go back to the uh, micro principles. Now, the first one, people face trade-offs. The translation here is really simple. Uh, choices are bad. This is a simple syllogism. Right? Trade-offs are bad. Anytime you have choices, you have trade-offs. Therefore, choices have to be bad. If you don't understand that, take a look at the second principle. The cost of something is what you give up to get it. Translation choices are really bad. I'm going to stop beating around the bush with you folks. If you don't understand why choices are bad, you're probably stupid. <laughs> Moving on, principle number three. <laughs> Rational people think at the margin. Translation, people are stupid. Right. Now, it is immediately obvious that people do not think at the margin. Nobody goes to the grocery store and says, I'm going to buy an orange. I'm going to buy another orange. I'm going to buy another orange. <laughs> that joke only makes sense to econ majors. <laughs> people don't think like that. OK, but if people don't think at the margin, and if, as Mankiw says, rational people do think at the margin, we are led to a most unhappy conclusion. People are not rational. People, in other words, are stupid. But before you despair for humanity, take a look at the next principle. People respond to incentives. Now, the dictionary says that incentive is a noun. That's a synonym for motive. So when Mankiw says that people respond to incentives, what he's saying is that people are motivated by motives. <laughs> You might think this is a bit like saying that tautologies are tautological, right? I mean, people would have to be pretty stupid to be unmotivated by motives. But remember principle three. People are stupid. Okay, hence the need for principle four to tell us that people aren't that stupid. All right, simplifying again, move on to free trade. Principle five, trade can make everyone better off. Translation, trade can make everyone worse off. Now, you may wonder how the translation of principle five is the opposite of the principle itself. I have a simple proof of this fact that will blow your mind. I want you to compare two statements. One of them is trade can make everyone better off. And the other one is trade will make everyone better off. Now, if you had to pick one of those two statements to put in your best-selling economics textbook, <laughs> right? it's no contest. The second statement is clearly better. But Mankiw uses the first statement instead. And if you think about why, there's only one possible explanation. The second statement has got to be wrong. In other words, trade can make some people worse off. And from there, it's just a hop, skip, and a jump to trade can make everyone worse off. <laughs> now, I figured some of you have some questions about this, so I added a footnote with some details to eat your heart out. <laughs> now that we've cleared that up, I want you to see the last two principles. Markets are usually a good way to organize economic activity. Translation, governments are stupid. And governments can sometimes improve market outcomes. Governments aren't that stupid. Follow immediately from principle five in its translation. OK, if trade can make everyone better off, what the heck do we need government for? Just let people trade. Okay, governments are stupid. But if trade can make everyone worse off, we better have a government around to stop people from trading. So there are the 10 principles of economics translated. I want to go back now to uh, I want to go back to this slide here because the example in the footnote is actually a real example. It is possible in a very made-up economics model sort of way to have a situation where trade makes everyone worse off. And since that relates to the work that I do on environmental economics and climate change, I want to talk you through that example real quick. 
So a made up story about these three people, orange, pink, and blue. And orange, pink, and blue all live in a small town. The small town has an air pollution problem. So think like Beijing, but with three people. And, and uh, I lived in Beijing for uh, five months recently. Here's uh, the view from my apartment on, an, on a nice day. Maybe 5% of the time it looked like this. Uh, much more often it looked like that. So they have significant air pollution problems uh, in China. Now, maybe these folks are actually they're Americans, though, because they each have a garage that's full of stuff that they don't use. All right. So now we're going to see some trades. So first, orange is going to sell a lawnmower to pink. And we can imagine that they each get $100 in value from that trade. Orange sells a lawnmower for 100 bucks that was just sitting in her garage. Pink would be willing to pay 200 bucks. She only has to pay 100, so she gets $100 in net benefits. But when Pink starts using that lawnmower that was just sitting in Orange's garage, lawnmowers create some air pollution. Maybe we can see some haze around the town. And like I said, made up economic story. Maybe we can monetize the health impacts of the air pollution at $80 per person. And not just for Orange and Pink, but also for Blue. So the impact on Blue is what economists call a negative externality. But note that orange and pink each get $20 in net benefits from that trade. They don't know about blue or they don't care about blue. So the trade still makes sense to them. Okay. So now I'll tell a similar story about pink and blue. Pink is going to sell a snowblower to blue. We can imagine that they each get $100 in benefits. Pink from selling the snowblower for $100 bucks that was just sitting in her garage. Blue would be willing to pay $200. She only has to pay $100, so she gets $100 in net benefits. But when blue starts using that snowblower, air pollution gets a little worse, maybe an additional $80 in health care costs for everyone. And now you just complete the circle. Blue is going to sell a leaf blower to orange. They get $100 in benefits. Air pollution gets worse. An additional $80 in health care costs for everyone. And now if you just add up any one of these columns, you see that after all three of those trades together, everybody ends up at minus 40. And right, so this is the tragedy of the commons, the prisoner's dilemma, if you're familiar with these ideas. But the economics here is that each person's trades are individually rational. If you ask any of these people if they want to take back any of the trades they make, They'll say no, because each trade they make leaves them $20 better off, but all together the trades end up hurting everybody. If you want to blabor the point and make, connect, and make a connection to climate change, you could, I don't know, like label the people. And this is in very broad strokes what economists are concerned about when it comes to climate change. Uh, everything I think that you need to know about climate change in just a couple of slides. Uh, first of all, carbon concentrations in the atmosphere are going up. Nobody doubts this. Almost nobody doubts this. It's primarily caused by human activity, burning fossil fuels, and deforestation. Secondly, we have this hypothesis, right, the greenhouse theory that says that if carbon concentrations go up, global temperatures are going to go up. So we can run the experiment. And that's what we've been doing on this planet for the last 150 years or so. And here are the results of the experiment. Temperatures and 10-year averages going up pretty much in line with the projections of climate science. If you happen to not believe that humans are partly responsible for increasing global temperatures, it's OK. I'm going to find common ground with you anyway. And the common ground comes from the way that economists think about pollution problems, which is that the way to get less pollution is to make polluting expensive. Because when you make polluting expensive, you get market forces working to promote innovation and conservation and the development of new technologies, all those things that I at least love about capitalism. So what I work on as an environmental economist is using the tools of capitalism and the power of capitalism to protect the environment. How do we do that? There are a couple of policy tools we need to talk about, like a carbon tax or an auction cap and trade system. But the point of both of those policies is to drive up the price of fossil fuels. At this point in my talks, people stop laughing. Because <laughs> it's a hard sell to say that we want to drive up the price of fossil fuels. But there is a side benefit other than like saving the planet. <laughs> And the side benefit is that if you do these policies right, you generate a pile of revenue. Right? And the government can do all sorts of good things with that revenue. I'm sure you each have your own ideas about what the government could do with a pile of revenue. But the idea that I go around talking to folks about is that we could be using most or all of that revenue to reduce or eliminate existing taxes. So it's called environmental tax reform or tax shifting. And the idea is that we should be taxing things we want less of, like carbon emissions, instead of taxing things we want more of. So right now we have taxes on income and savings and investment and payroll and things we want more of. Right? So the idea of environmental tax reform is to have lower taxes on those things and have higher taxes on things we want less of, uh, like carbon emissions. There's even a place that's done this just to our north, up in the Canadian province of British Columbia. They have a revenue neutral carbon tax, uh, what I consider to be the best climate policy in the world right now. Uh, and uh, the way that it works, over a couple of years, they're going to bring in about $3.5 billion a year in revenue. And 
All of that money is being used to reduce personal and corporate income taxes in the province of British Columbia. There's an offset for low income households, really a terrific policy up there in British Columbia. And part of what I work on is advancing similar policies in Washington state, elsewhere in the United States uh, and around the world. And this is actually where I think we can find uh, common ground, even with folks who don't happen to believe that humans are partly responsible for climate change. Uh, George Will, the Washington Post columnist, came to one of my classes once. He doesn't think humans are responsible for climate change, but I asked him if he would support replacing the payroll tax, the employment tax in this country, with a carbon tax. And he said that he was all for it, because he hates the payroll tax. And you know what? With unemployment at 8.5%, I hate the payroll tax. Right? And Al Gore hates the payroll tax. Al Gore says we should tax what we burn and not what we earn. So I asked George Will what he thought about the fact that he and Al Gore agreed on this particular issue. And George Will said, well, he said, an idea should not be held responsible for the people who believe in it. <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is that there are people across the political spectrum, certainly economists from Paul Krugman on the left to folks like Art Laffer, even Greg Mankiw on the right, who think that this is a fine idea. Mankiw likes it so much, he's actually started up a Facebook fan club called the Pugu Club, uh, advancing this idea. Right? So I actually think that uh, in order to make progress on climate change, we're going to have to do it in a bipartisan way. And the way to get bipartisan action on climate change is through a revenue-neutral carbon tax, like the one that they have in British Columbia. Thank you very much.